And so this doesn't eliminate the weirdness of entanglement, but it's a different way to think about the weirdness of entanglement. Rather than saying that one thing over here instantaneously has an effect or influence over there, the statement is that something is happening in the past within their light cones, but in a way that's non-Markovian and isn't easily capturable in the premises of Bell's theorem and subsequent theorems. This is a good place to pivot to the third and final part of our discussion, which is about the future of entanglement. Um, what do new theories in physics, uh, maybe theories uh, of quantum theory, new models to understand or explain how quantum theory works to replace the old paradigms, uh, or new theories that show up in quantum gravity? How do new theories um, uh, uh, change how we think about uh, entanglement and its future? Yes. Yvette, do you want to start with that? Yes, I l love that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, so we have quantum mechanics and it has this, these, well, several features that we're st still struggling, struggling after 100 years to understand. Like uh, uh, Tim said, like this, this spooky action of the distance, if you want, that we're, we're happy to accept it, but we still want to understand it better. And then on the other hand, we've been already talking about relativity and how when we look at applications or consequences of this uh, feature of entanglement, then maybe we can use it to do technology, to make things happen in the, in the real world. But we need to, as you can see, like the, the, the issues of relativity come into, and we haven't been able as well to find a way to unify quantum mechanics and general relativity. Um, so I actually think that um, quantum mechanics has to be modified so that we can um, uh, unify it with relativity. And like I mentioned before, I think the way in which we have to modify it is by understanding what is the effect of gravity and uh, relativity on the quantum state. And I do think that if you have one of the superpositions that Jacob was uh, talking about in which you can have a particle in a superposition of being left and right, if the particle is massive, then it's sort of self gravitational. It's very crazy to imagine like a particle and in itself and then acting gravitationally, that could lead to the reduction of the, the state. So in that sense, that's already a modification of the theory of um, um, quantum mechanics that we've been talking about because that's not a part of it in the standard uh, theory that uh, we learned at a uh, university. But I also think that we need to modify uh, gravity, I, um, relativity. I, I don't see how to put them together without somehow changing both. And I am looking into that and I'm looking at to possible changes that one wants to do to general relativity, but I want to make a very little change because in a way I want to be conservative uh, and, and, and so on. So I think they both have to change. So once we get a theory that uh, is consistent, well, who knows what happens to entanglement? Will it still be the same? I can't tell because it might also uh, change and we will have to um, interpret it. No. Um, about the the standard uh, approaches to quantum gravity, so the more standard ones are string theory and loop quantum gravity. And um, but I, I'm not very satisfied with these approaches so far because they don't have like a way to test them in the laboratory. So until that is not possible, I don't see how would this really be able to change very practical things like already we have experiments in satellites distributing entanglement and using it for quantum cryptography. So in that sense, I think we need to find some way of putting the theories together, do experiments, test that those theories are right, and then we'll see. Tim? Okay, so this is a nice panel because I'm going to go the other direction. <laughs> um, that is, I yeah, the, it, it's really hard to put together quantum theory and and, and relativity. I think what has to give is relativity. And I don't think it's a small tweak. I think I mean, what I'm working on myself, someday I'll pop, is a big tweak, an entirely different picture of space-time where you, you have, and I know other people 
trying this in other ways where we call what we call emergent relativity. They use a, a fundamental theory that just doesn't look at all like what you learn in relativity, but you see how at large scales in certain circumstances relativistic looking structures naturally come out of it. In a way, that, that's what Einstein did to Newton. I mean, Einstein didn't make a small tweak to Newton's theory of gravity. He said, look, there is no force of gravity. I'm going to do this with curvature of space-time. A huge change at the bottom, but it, the, the empirical changes that, the, that come out of it are very subtle and, and very small. Um, as I said, I hope that we might be able to demonstrate superluminal signaling. That would change, everybody would agree, that would change the game like that. Uh, I, there are schemes to, 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 to do this. I could talk about it in a larger thing. The only person I know of who thinks they can really get rid of entanglement that I've heard of is sitting right next to me. Yes, and we want to hear um, more so about So we that. should hear about how he thinks he might get rid of entanglement. I don't know how it's done. Thank you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so at the end of my PhD, I was trying to simulate complicated systems of exotic black holes in N equals two supergravity. Um, these systems were extremely complicated and very difficult to study in, uh, by pen and paper, so I had to use numerical simulations. Um, and I picked up some uh, techniques, uh, there's a system of techniques called uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques. The details don't matter, but it connected with some stuff I learned earlier when I was an undergraduate about linear algebra. Uh, and and it, this theory, the theory of stochastic processes. So I, I worked with these, these uh, numerical tools. Uh, ultimately, we made some progress on the problem, but I was really fascinated by the formalism of stochastic processes. So the word stochastic comes from the Greek word stochastikos, which is to aim or guess. Um, when you have some physical process unfolding and its behavior is probabilistic, so we can use probabilities for many things. I don't know what a coin is gonna show, I assign probabilities. But when you're talking about a, a physical thing that's changing in some probabilistic way, usually we use the word stochastic for that behavior. It's a particular uh, application of the idea of probability. And in these stochastic models, you've got ingredients, physical things bounding around in some unpredictable way, but at the least you can, you can describe that behavior, characterize it using the language of probability. Now, what's interesting about this theory of stochastic processes is it bears some resemblances at a bird's eye view to some of the mathematics of quantum theory. Uh, both theories use things called vectors to encode probabilities. Both theories use things called matrices to describe time evolution. And obviously, both theories involve probabilities and randomness and predictions and measurements. So there are some very superficial similarities. And a couple of years ago, for a pedagogical exercise, I was really trying to teach a class to students who didn't know very much about the requisite mathematics. I sat down to try to bring these two theories together, maybe to see if we could understand one or the other of them a little bit better, and maybe even find a simpler way to axiomatize, to formulate quantum theory. And something very remarkable happened as I was doing this. The theories just merged, and there wasn't a gap between them anymore. And I was very surprised because this is a thing you couldn't do. You couldn't describe quantum theory just as some relatively boring theory of things bouncing around probabilistically. Where's entanglement? Where's non locality? Where's all this stuff in quantum theory? And after reviewing what I had done a while, I realized that I'd given up implicitly a central assumption that has proved extremely useful to physics for a very, very long time. But people in the so-called special sciences, biology, neuroscience, chemistry, have long ago given up. And it's the idea of the Markov assumption. So our laws of physics going back to Newton are of the form. You know the present state or configuration of your system and your laws, think F equals MA. Your laws allow you to take that present state and predict, at least in principle, the laws determine what is going to happen. In some cases, in Newtonian mechanics, it happens in principle deterministically. If you know the initial positions and velocities of your system, you can predict where it's going to go. Uh, but many of our other theories, the Maxwell theories of electromagnetism and the Schrodinger equation have this property. If you know the present state or configuration, the laws tell you what happened. But of course, in quantum theory, we have this weird hybrid set of axioms. We've got deterministic looking axioms, and then we have these weird probabilistic axioms. So um, if you give up that Markov assumption, if you allow it to be the case that the patterns of phenomena taking place in nature are most simply described probabilistically, what you find is you can do it in a way that is remarkably simple, 
arguably with axioms simpler than the Dirac von Neumann axioms, as long as you give up the Markov assumption. Now, giving up the Markov assumption in principle is quite dangerous because the class of non-Markovian theories is vast, and it might seem like you need to make an infinite number of assumptions before you can make any useful predictions. But there's a narrow class of non-Markovian systems. The, the term for them was introduced uh, uh, in 2008 in the theory of quantum information and with some later work in 2020, 2021 by others. They called this narrow class of non-Markovian systems indivisible. The indivisibility refers to the inability to just iterate the laws, present moment to later moment, present moment to later moment. It's a particular way of studying non-Markovian systems. The technical details don't matter so much, except that it appears this gives you an equivalent way to describe quantum theory with simpler axioms. Now, instead of all this you know, quantum states and all this stuff, you just have objects of some kind, depending on what model you're dealing with. It could be particles, if you're modeling particles or fields. Uh, and the laws that describe these things are inherently probabilistic from the beginning. Uh, and they don't just depend on the present state of things. In principle, they can depend on the past. Uh, and so this doesn't eliminate the weirdness of entanglement, but it, it's a different way to think about the weirdness of entanglement. Rather than saying that one thing over here instantaneously has an effect or influence over there, the statement is that something is happening in the past within their light cones, but in a way that's non-Markovian and isn't easily capturable in the premises of Bell's theorem and subsequent theorems. So that's a very high level overview about all of this. But I'm very excited about it because number one, I think it gives a simpler way to think about where quantum mechanics comes from. It's no longer got this weird hybrid mixture of deterministic and indeterministic elements. It gives a new way to think about where the correlation- To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. With a free trial, you can enjoy the full talk and thousands more. Thank you for being part of the conversation.